Buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, first of all, I want to go over a couple of comments uh, because you guys are the most important. Uh, and so there are very few that are bold enough to speak out. And so I do appreciate that very much. And so I want to share this one comment here from Cedell3883. Okay, first of all, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they, uh, they posted a video um, in regards to, I think they said something like a thousand year reign. And so in my comments, you know, I'm trying to reach out and trying to make things easy for people to understand. And so I want to share this with you and perhaps you'll be able to see it for yourself. All right. And so I say uh, in regards to Revelation 20 verses 4 and 6, for example. Okay. Where it says, <clears throat> where it says uh, something says something here it says and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and blah 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 and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years all right so they being the saved which are those of us that are born of God we live and reign with Christ right now this is a unique time period that we are in right now my concern is I hear a lot of people say Jesus reigns a thousand years. He doesn't. Jesus reigns forever. In fact, Revelation 20 never makes any mention of Jesus reigning 1,000 years. Your quote, um, referring to what she said, <clears throat> they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Never says Jesus reigns 1,000 years. It's not talking about Jesus reigning 1,000 years. They lived and reigned with. For example, Pete Alonzo lived and played with the New York Mets for six years. That doesn't mean the New York Mets have only been around for six years. All right, and so that's the analogy that I used, and I, that she, I think, uh, struck a chord with her, and she saw it. And she, if you make the comparison, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, and Pete Alonzo lived and played with the New York Mets for six years. It doesn't mean Christ reigns a thousand years. It doesn't mean Pete Alon or the I'm sorry, it doesn't mean the New York Mets were only around for six years, right? Let me say that again. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That doesn't mean Jesus <clears throat> reigns a thousand years. Pete Alonzo lived and played with the New York Mets for six years. It doesn't mean the New York Mets have only been around for six years. It means Pete Alonzo was part of the ball club for this period of six years. They, the saved, lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That means the saved people were part of the club during this thousand year period. That's all that means. All right, so again, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. This should be a clue that nobody's resurrected until after the thousand years are finished. But somehow people have twisted it and the blind don't see it. But they'll say the first resurrection occurs before. Even though the text says live not again until after. It's astonishing really. Now, of course, those of us with eyes to see, we know that Jesus is the first resurrection. All right, Even in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is referred to as the first begotten of the dead. Right? And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 
He is the first fruits of them that slept. Right? As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Right? And even in John chapter 11, Jesus plainly says, I am the resurrection. All right, so in Revelation 20, when we read the first resurrection, it's Jesus. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Right? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first fruits of them that slept. Then afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Right? Live not again until after the thousand years. Right? Right now, we are kings and priests unto God. Right now, we reign with Christ. Right now. All right? And so, it's to me, it's pretty obvious that the reason people don't see it is because they're trusting man rather than God. And this is God. This is the word of God. God. It is God. And if you don't believe that, then of course you're not going to see it. Okay? So, anyways, I just, I find that interesting that somebody finally has eyes to see and uh, this person was very gracious in her comment and said, I understand now, sorry. See what you're saying about with and that Jesus reigns forever. Right, real quickly. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Right, so again, you can't have Jesus reigning a thousand years when the Bible is clear that he reigns forever. Thank you for explaining and for helping me be more aware. Lord bless you. Lord lead. On a side note, my husband is a Mets fan. All right. So, no, I appreciate that. I mean, because everybody seems like, oh, you're the devil. You know, they get mad at you. You, gotta, you said something different than what I said. You're going to hell. Well, look, I'm just saying, look, this is what God says. <laughs> You know, this is not my word. This is his word. And, I, you know, if there's any chance for you to be helped, somebody has to show you. No. I mean, you're not seeing it? Let me show it to you. Because I know you've seen it. Let me shine some light on it. That's all. Okay. All right, then, um, then I think there was a comment. Uh, yeah, this morning, a half an hour ago, yes. Um, who, uh, from, this is from Three Bad Bostons. All right, he says, Who is not saved equals those who do not believe Jesus is the risen Savior. Not saved because... Because they are not his, he will not lose one the Father has given him. I agree with that. Of all which the Father has given me, I shall lose nothing. And nothing means nothing. He ain't going to lose one single person. John chapter 6 verse 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing nothing but should raise it up again at the last day at the last day is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven at the end of the world again when you see stuff like this 
compare it to what you're reading in Revelation 20 and you oh excuse me and you should know that when fire comes down from God out of heaven it's the end of the world right and when it's the end of the world what happens well before fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them we are lifted up in the air we're not gonna get devoured by fire we're up in the air with the Lord Jesus when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven in a moment in the twinkling of night the last trump the trump of hell shall and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord right this happens at the end of the world so when fire comes down from God out of heaven we're up in the air remember Jesus says I go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also right so we are up in the air and so when it says here in verse 9 and they the unsaved compass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city where's that at the camp of the saints in the beloved city that's up in the air and these people are down at our feet right they can't there's no other possibility there's no other possibility in fact in Revelation 3 for example I mean we, we can go to Genesis 3 verse 15 as well but one example behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet see we're up in the air they're at our feet and to know that I have loved thee first Corinthians 15 for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet we're up in the air they're at our feet Genesis 3 verse 15 the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel see G Jesus is gonna stomp his foot on the head of the serpent destroying evil forever all right Psalm 110 for you for the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool in Acts chapter 2 till I make thy foes thy footstool it's over and over and over and over all throughout the Bible this is prophesied the end of the world right and then of course in Revelation 20 if there was any doubt we read in Revelation 21 the holy city comes down from God out of heaven the holy city the beloved city right the camp of the saints is up in heaven so after fire comes down from God out of heaven the holy city the beloved city comes down from God out of heaven onto a new earth with a new heaven and again I wanted okay so well I was gonna go talk about this video here from this morning John John Barnett but before I get to that I want to go back to this comment here I would add that someone who places their opinion of others people's eternal destiny may not be saved you do know salvation is of the Lord right you do not even know the way I'm not doing the same thing you are because we better think hard about this one because I do not put judgment on whether or not somebody is saved or not despite what they say all right so you I'm going to show you that you're rejecting the Word of God right here does not the Bible teach us that Jesus will separate the sheep and the goats and the angels will separate the wheat from the chaff 
It is foolish to even consider these things. You're calling God foolish. That's that's terrible. I wouldn't. I'd be very careful about that. No. So what I'm sharing with you, what I share with with you in this video, and what I continue to share with you all on a daily basis is the Word of God. I'm not just making this stuff up. All right, so let me, first of all, let me address this. Um, he, he's actually, he realized, it, I can see it in the comment. He's realizing he's being a hypocrite. And then he, but he wants to turn around and say, well, I'm not doing what it looks like I'm doing. All right. Okay, so first of all, let's go to Matthew 7. Oh, excuse me. Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets. See, <clears throat> we're being we're not just being warned. This is not just a blanket warning. Hey, there's going to be false prophets. Okay. Well, how the hell are we going to know who's a false prophet? No, you you're not going to know. You're not going to know and it's going to be foolish to even try to think about it. Huh? It's foolish to even think about it, even though God throws this out here. It's like, whoa. God makes that statement, beware of false prophets, and now we can't think about it? Uh, that, ain't, that ain't ringing right to me. That don't ring right. That, that ain't ringing true, buddy. In fact, if you were to actually keep reading just a little bit, you would see... Here, let me read. Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. You know what that means, right? They look like they're saved people. They say they believe in Jesus Christ. All right? That's what they do. They look like they look like sheep. They look like the saved people. They they walk around with a Bible in their hand. They then they say praise Jesus. So if we're not supposed to think about it, why is God putting it into his book? Why is he speaking to us about it if we're not supposed to think about it, if it's foolish to even consider the word of God? Well, who do you think this comes from right here? God or the devil? <laughs> It's quite obvious to me. I mean, come on, man. This is not vain words. There's a purpose and a meaning behind these words. And if you consider... Consider... Uh, consider something. Here, just give me a second. He says... He says, don't consider. It's even foolish to consider, but I want you to consider. No matter how foolish you think it is, I want you to consider this. I should have done it. Okay, all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right, so all scripture, so this isn't in vain. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Right? And this is, there's, there's a real value in this. Real value. True value. You shall know them by their fruits. This is key. You shall know them. You say, well, you can't know. But the Bible, well, God, God says we can know. So you're saying it is foolish to even consider when 
God says we shall know them by their fruits. We shall know who the false prophets are, the false teachers, by their fruits, by what it is they are teaching. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby, I'm sorry, wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. All right, consider, let me give you one easy, for me, an easy example, okay? For me, this is an easy example. Somebody that teaches a doctrine that says or suggests that an unsaved person can wait. Okay, that's a bad tree that produces evil fruit evil fruit because you're telling the unsaved people that they can wait and then Jesus comes and they find out they're wrong that they couldn't wait that now it's too late because they waited now they're gonna die the second death but you told them that they could wait and they're in error because they listen to you that's an example of something that brings forth evil fruit all right now look I get it 99.9% .9 of the preachers today preach doctrines that suggest unsaved people can wait until Jesus comes and then they'll have an additional thousand years to believe doesn't make it true it could be a hundred percent it still won't make it true all right there is no thousand year period coming period the only opportunity unsaved people have is today it's right now all right and you, it's just an evil wicked thing to teach any sort of doctrine that suggests an unsafe person can wait. And that's exactly what this thousand year stuff is. It's teaching unsafe people that they can wait. All right. It's pure evil. Pure. It's as cruel as anything any man could possibly teach. All right. Now, I want you to consider this also. Okay, whereby their fruits, I'm sorry, I did that again. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, and the will of my Father is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. Now, what's going on here? These people, just like as we, what we read here in Beware of False Prophets, they come in sheep's clothing, they look like Christians. Here we got an example of Christians or people calling themselves Christians, right? And saying, Lord, Lord, Jesus. They believe in Jesus Christ. And they are preaching, teaching uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Prophesying, pe preaching from the Bible. Preaching the word of God. And then casting out devils in the name of Jesus Christ. Counseling, helping people overcome addictions helping people with marriage problems in the name of Jesus Christ and doing many wonderful works in the name of Jesus Christ they are providing food banks and clothing and community work 
you know, mowing grass and picking up branches and all sorts of wonderful, wonderful works for people that are not able to, to do these things. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. These people were never saved. They were never one of us. Why? They look just like us. They dominate the churches. But they're not one of us. Why? Well, obviously. It's because they trust themselves. They think that because they're a good person, they're going to be saved. And they're not a good person. Therefore, they're not going to be saved. Right? And they're not a good person because there's none of us that are good. Not one of us. That's what the law shows us. The, the law is there to show us that we're not good. But these people, they, they think they're doing many wonderful works, good things. Man, they're, they're so far lost. And the bad part about it is they, they think they're saved they think they're righteous right and so uh so they're not they're not they're not so it's uh what's interesting now is that we are being dominated that way in that sort of way and we're it's so bad now it is it's almost impossible for the young people to get saved because they're seeing that the churches and their community are being dominated by these types of people that preach this idea that they ha they have to be good, All right? And th the young people they know they're not good, and they don't care about all this stuff here. And so why even bother, right? And so now what happens is we have a whole generation of unsaved people dominating inside the church and outside of the church. And this is why we have, for example, in Matthew 24, <clears throat> where it says, Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. All right, so if God allowed things to play out the way they are, there will come a point to where nobody's saved. Right? You think about in the days of Noah, there was only eight souls saved. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. So if there was only eight people saved back then, why would you think there would be more than eight people saved when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven? And then, of course, consider this. If Jesus comes today, well, how many people on earth are saved? Let's say today's the day, right? So how many people, what's the number you would throw out there, right? What's the number that you would throw out there? How many Christians are in the world today? And the survey says 2.4 billion Christians. Well, consider what we just read in Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And in that day they shall say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. All right, so this 2.4 billion, is that included? <laughs> no, no, no. That, what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 7, I never knew you, could very possibly be talking about the 2.4 billion right here in this survey or whatever you want to call it it's google stuff here i mean what's the number that you would throw out 
You throw out well, two million? You think there's two million people saved in the world today? Yeah, I'm not talking about just in your own country. And this actually would be 20. If you, 2.4 minus 2.38 would be 20 million. But let's say there's 2 million. If you want to say, let's say you say there's 2 million people all around the world that are saved. Well, and then I would say, God, Jesus ain't coming back. Not today. If there's 2 million people in the world today, it's too soon. Way, way too soon. If you said there was 200,000 people in the world today that are saved, way too soon. 20,000, way too soon. 2,000, way too soon. 200? Still too soon, but we're getting close. 20? Yeah, it's not long now. If there's only 20 saved, it's not long. Well, then if there's two saved, then it's time. Right, because of what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we read... Uh, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive. All right, so that, that has to be two. It can't be less than two. All right, so again, in the days of Noah, there was only eight people saved. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven... That's probably the number of people that are going to be saved on the earth. And so if Jesus comes today, there might only be eight people saved in the world right now. And the evidence that I give has been provided on a daily basis. All these guys that are teaching false doctrines, they don't have any idea. It's incredible. It's incredible. And I was going to go over this guy here. Maybe let me finish it up. I'll give you another example. Just one more example. All these guys. Man, you look at how popular these guys are. They dress up real nice. They, they look like Christians, don't they? Dressed in sheep's clothing. They look real nice. But they're all preaching evil. Their doctrines are evil. All right, so let's get let's show you an example. And I'll, I'll try to close out here. Okay, first of all, this gentleman here, it, he's making the connection. He's connecting the dots from Isaiah 65 to 2 Peter chapter 3. All right. All right, so let's pull those up. and then take a ganders at it <clears throat> and we see here in Isaiah 65 for behold I create a new heavens and a new earth all right in 2nd Peter chapter 3 looking for and hasting unto or something or another's I forget nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And of course, Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. These are all the same uh, reference, right? They're, they're all meaning the same, same point in time when there's a new heaven and a new earth. All right, that's interesting, okay? That's interesting. Now we can connect these dots and establish these points. All right, so the deceiver because he doesn't believe he's not going to be able to see it. All right. So he's got this whole, all this stuff here. I could do this. I was thinking about this. I could do this. But all I would really need is a line starting over here. And then on top of it, I would say the beginning. 
and then the line would go all the way over here and I put it on an up and down line and say the end and after the end is the new heaven and a new earth and that would be the best timeline you could possibly find on the internet this stuff here this is comic book stuff all right and so what he's got he's okay just to summarize he says that there will come a new heaven and a new earth when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven there's that's undeniable all right just as we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, But the day the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then comes the new heavens and the new earth. So Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth. Alright, I don't, do I even want to play any of this? I mean, it's so ridiculous. Okay, so he then completely forgets what he said completely like like a zombie robot or something it's just so bizarre to me he then turns around gets to revelation 20 and says that there will be a thousand year period Where he's going to say that this here is the, th the temple of God and it's in the Middle East. And that we saints are in it. Here, let's listen to a little bit of what he says. The temple where Jesus is reigning, the saints, see the camp of the saints... They can't get enough of the Lord. They want to be as close to him as possible. And so they start migrating. People, as the world seemingly is not interested in God, the longer the millennium goes on, the more unbelievers there are. The more their children don't like going through the temple. They don't like watching those old messy sacrifices. Why? All right, so did you catch that? He's saying that, Jesus will come and set up a temple on the earth for a period of a thousand years and that they will go back to animal sacrifices. All right, so in other words, Jesus died in vain. Now, I don't know how you could be this ignorant. All right. It, you could this is only for people that do not know what the Bible says or what he says right for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified but that's not true according to John Barnett right that's not true because Jesus is going to come back and um, he's going to, you know, he's going to bring back the sacrifices. And the, the people are going to be going to the temple and doing the sacrifices. You know, the sacrifice of blood and, or the, the sacrifice of bulls and goats. And I know where he's getting that from. Uh, he's getting it from the Old Testament, obviously. He's not getting it from the New Testament. He's not understanding nothing. All right. Now, I don't want to get into all that. But it's interesting, right? It's interesting. To me, in particular, because... Here, let me back up a little bit. Let's go right here. No, let's go back here. There. He says this is in Jerusalem during this thousand-year period. On the earth. Alright. After Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right. Are you following me on this? Because in Second Peter chapter 3. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. 
the heaven and earth pass away, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth. All right, so consider this. Jesus comes. Are you thinking about, are you listening? Are you paying attention? According to John Barnett, Jesus comes, sets up a temple in the Middle East for a thousand years, and then afterward, it's the end of the world. Fire comes down from God and devours them. It's the end of the world. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. And the, another new city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, comes down from God out of heaven. Are you getting this? Are you seeing this? John Barnett says this new city was already on the earth before it came down from heaven. Are you seeing how nonsensical this is? You see how illogical this is? It's quite obvious to me. I don't know how else, how I can't, I don't know how to make it more easy for people to see. John 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare, prepare, uh, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So when Jesus comes, we're going to be lifted up in the air. The earth is going to be destroyed. And we're going to be set back down onto the earth, a new earth, new heavens. And the holy city, that my father's house, our many mansions, he goes to prepare a place for us. That's the new city, the holy city, new Jerusalem. It's in heaven. So when Jesus comes down, he, he brings us down back onto a new earth with him. Right? And we got the new city. And that's what John is describing. In Revelation 21, and this is exactly what is being described in Second Peter chapter 3 and Isaiah 65. Same thing. And so, if we back up just a little bit to Revelation 20, we must conclude that this thousand year period is before the new heavens and the new earth. It is this thousand year period is before the new city comes down from God. Therefore in Revelation 20 the beloved city has to be up in the air and the saints have to be up in the air with the Lord. And the fire that comes down from God out of heaven is the end of the world has to be just as we read in second peter chapter 3 the day the lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also then the works that are therein shall be burned up and fire came down from god out of heaven that's the end of the world All right so the thousand years has to be before the end of the world that we know that the earth was destroyed by water in the days of noah and now the earth is kept in um sorry the the earth is reserved unto fire it was reserved for fire right so the earth was destroyed by water in the days of Noah. Right now it's being reserved for fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The end of the world. It's the end of the world. Right? I mean, it's so obvious. It's so simple. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's the end of the world. 
right? And again, I, I ha I'll ha I'll cl I'll uh, close it on this. All right. So in Matthew 24, for example, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why? Because they know it's the end of the world. In Revelation chapter 1, we read that all the tribes or all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, all kindreds of the earth shall wail. Why? Because they know it's the end of the world. There won't be a thousand year bonus period after Jesus comes. It's, that's it. So the unsaved have one opportunity in us right now. It's today. In Luke 21, people are going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. Men's hearts will be failing them for fear. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there is no bonus thousand years. You know it. You deep down in your soul, you know it. And these guys know it too. But they're so full of lust that they're hoping for a bonus thousand years. They're just, they're believing that they can just hope it into existence. A thousand year period where they're going back into their 20 year old bodies. And they're going to be surrounded by 20 year old women. And they're going to be free. If you know what I mean. And that's, that's why I'm convinced of it. Because. Well, alright. I was going to end on that. but Because of Jude 18 and 2 Peter 3. Alright, let me just. I'll use one example this time. Knowing this first. That there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. How that they told you in the last time there should be mockers, scoffers, something. Here, let me find it. Mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. That's why they teach a thousand year period. Getting them to admit it, that's difficult. Only a few of them do admit it. And if you, I think if you take the approach of, hey, are there going to be people having children? If you put it in a nice sort of way, if you don't be mean and rotten like me and condescending and, and arrogant and all that sort of stuff, that the way I am, right? Because I'll just say, hey, do you think there'll be stinky sex after Jesus comes? Or however it is that I phrase it. Right? Now, if I put it that way, they're going to be, rah, 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 you're the devil. But if you, if you go to them and you say, in a nice sort of way, will we be having children after the resurrection? You know, after Jesus comes? Maybe if you phrased it that way, it would make their head spin. It might even fall off. If you if you said, "Hey, after, will we be when Jesus comes at, after the resurrection? Will we be having children?" Because here, they're going to have a problem because Jesus says in the resurrection they don't have steamy stinky sex i mean uh, they don't get married see jesus lot he's a lot nicer than i am he's a lot smarter than i am and he knows how to use his words a lot better than i do all right so but but it still means the same thing in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage in other words they're they're not having stinky sex Right. Now, of course, we could have figured that out 
have we read and understood Genesis 3, we would know that there was no steamy, stinky sex until after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the curse of eating from that tree is steamy, slimy, stinky sexual activity. All right, and that's how we produce, you know, children, right? But now, afterward, that's going to be done away with. All right, okay, so that's enough. Anyways, uh, thanks for the comments here. If anybody's still listening, if there's anybody still out there, thanks. Thank you. I want to hear from you. Because the time is short, and why not? I mean, I, I really believe that. Today might be the last day. Today might be it. We'll find out. If today's not the last day, hopefully I'll be back tomorrow. Right? All right, adios, amigos.